on, come on, come on. What is your name, Paul? Sometimes you don't get breakthrough until you push through. Sometimes you don't get breakthrough until you push through. Push through. Give it to him anyway. Give him worship anyway. Give him glory anyway. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, there's a move of God today. We're believing Him. There's a move of God. We're trusting Him. Oh, there's a move of God. Oh, we can't wait to see what the Lord is going to do. You may take your seats. You may take your seats. You may take your seats. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Good morning, Freedom Movement Church. Good morning, Freedom Movement Church. If you are grateful that you made it to church one more time, you ought to just give him praise one more time. Hallelujah. It is a blessing to see everybody here. Listen, we're going to jump right into the word of God. Hallelujah. I know we have been in the sermon series called Breakthrough. But the Spirit of the Lord has told me to deviate from that just for a little while. Hallelujah. The Lord has given me an emergency message. The Lord has given me an emergency message. You ever was watching TV and your regularly scheduled program was going on? Then they say, we interrupt your regularly scheduled program. For a special report. Hallelujah. This is an emergency message. And we're going to shift and we're going to hear what the Lord says. Hallelujah. I don't know if we're going to shout. I don't know if we're going to dance. But truth be told, I didn't come to try to make you shout. I came to tell the truth. I came to tell you what thus saith the Lord. God has something very pressing that he wants to speak into his people. Let he that hath an ear, let him or her hear what the Spirit of the Lord says. Hallelujah. We're going to jump right into the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go right there. Let's go right there. Open up your Bible to the book of 1 Peter. Open up your Bible to the book of First Peter. And for your hearing, we're going to read First Peter chapter 12, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. As is our custom, we'd ask everybody to stand for the reading and the hearing of the word of God. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and and 13. Hallelujah. When you have it, say amen. You don't have it, say hold up, preacher. Hallelujah. You want to get to 1 Peter? Turn to the back of the Bible. Start turning the pages. You will eventually get there. I promise you. Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12. <laughs> 13. When you have it, somebody just confidently say, I got it. It reads as follows. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But re 
rejoice. Y'all missed it. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And the people of God said, amen. amen. I need somebody to repeat after me. We will, we will. get through this. Get One more time. I don't think I heard your confidence. Somebody repeat after me. Somebody say, we will, we will. get through this. Amen. I didn't hear you. Somebody with a loud voice that you know if God be for you, who can be against you? Somebody say, we will. Get through this. Clap your hands if you believe it right now. Everybody remain standing right where we are. Father, we bless your name. We give you glory and honor and praise. We thank you that you are here moving in our midst. And we thank you for the word that you have set before us, Lord. Oh, we need to hear from you and we need a word from you like never before. So I ask right now that you would speak, Lord, like you've never spoken, Lord. Oh, use me, hide me behind your cross, fresh anointing, fall fresh. Oh, speak purely for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Oh, speak to us right now for this time, for this season, Lord God. Let us look to you and not turn to the left or to the right in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, order our steps. Oh, God, give us clarity. Oh, God, give us wisdom. Oh, God, give us protection. Oh, God, give us safety. Oh, God, that you would move by the power of your spirit and provide a hedge of protection around your people like never before in the name of Jesus. So, Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive, Lord, and you will be glorified in all things. We thank you that the devil is a liar and a loser. We thank you that we have victory in you. And we thank you, Lord God, that we will be victorious no matter what. And we stand on your word, stand on your truth, stand on your promises, Lord. And we know it's already done and we believe it by faith, by faith, by faith in Jesus' name. So have your way, Lord. Oh, Lord, knock over every distraction, knock over every hindrance. Knock over everything that's a stumbling block to our faith. Knock it over right now in the name of Jesus. Knock it over, God. Oh, God, that we would be focused. That we would keep our minds stayed on you. That you would get all the glory. That you would get all the honor. And you would get all the praise. Hallelujah. So have your way. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. And we give you the glory and we give you the praise. We ask it all in Jesus' name. People of God, shout it amen. 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 You may take your seats. We will get through this. In order to effectively and successfully live a lifestyle of victory, we must embrace the inevitable reality of trials and tribulations. Amen. There is no way that anybody in here can effectively declare and decree that you have the victory if you have not yet embraced the reality of storms. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is very, very important. Can I go a step further and let you know something very important? If the believer does not embrace this reality, hear me, it will be impossible to grow in your faith. Let me say that again. I think you missed it. If the believer does not embrace the reality of trials and tribulations, it will be impossible for us to grow in our faith. It is very counterproductive 
to only say yes to the blessings of God, but say no to any kind of sufferings that come from walking with God. Did you hear what I said? And let me say this as well. I need you to hear me. One of the most dangerous things that I'm seeing in the body of Christ, maybe you're seeing it too, is something that I call stagnant, immature faith. I didn't say one of the most dangerous things is immature faith. Because truth be told, no matter where your faith level is, you always have room to take it up a notch. But I am talking about stagnant, immature faith. What's the difference? Immature faith, that's something that you may have when you come to Christ. But you can grow out of it and God can bring you up and now your faith can grow over time. But stagnant, immature faith is the believer that comes to church but has no desire to grow. That person that there is no intention and there is no resolve in them to grow from where they are. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes, Can I talk about it for a second? See, you have to understand that if you have stagnant, immature faith, it has a way of producing offense towards God. What did I mean by that? If you have stagnant, immature faith, Every time you go through something, you begin to get mad at God, wondering how he let that happen to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stagnant, immature faith says, I can't believe you allowed this to happen, and I was doing what I was supposed to do. See, this thing must not have been real in the first place. I thought God was going to protect me and keep me and blessing me. Little do they know, part of the blessing is the trial. Yeah. I'm going to talk to myself. Y'all can, can just talk amongst yourself. Realizing that part of the blessing is some things that you have to go through so you can see the salvation of the Lord. But many times they have such an offense and an attitude with God that they end up developing a resentful relationship. But with people that have mature faith, mature faith produces gratitude. Okay. See, when you have mature faith, you have gratitude. Not just because God blessed you and gave you the promotion. You'll have gratitude for the valley. Who, what am I talking about? You'll start to have gratitude for the valley because you know what you say? I might be in the valley, but at least I'm chosen. <laughs> at least God knows my name. At least, yes, I'm in here, but I don't have to go in here by myself because, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It produces gratitude because instead of complaining about the wilderness, you are grateful that you're finally learning how to hear the voice of God. And now you know that I needed to be by myself because how was I going to get to know God? How was I going to get to know myself if I didn't have a wilderness situation? So when I have mature faith, instead of me having my mouth all poked out, instead of me complaining and grumbling, I have a way of experiencing gratitude because I don't know about you. I would rather suffer with God than have judgment without God. I would rather have to go through some of these things for the sake of the gospel rather than having a destiny that includes the pit of hell. Is there somebody, are you going to watch in stagnant, immature faith or are you going to walk in maturity? Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, immature, stagnant faith produces fear. Y'all not talking to me, that's all right. Many times, people, and it is a, a most dangerous thing for somebody to be in Christ, but to be in a constant state of fear. How are you going to be in Christ and in fear at the same time? That's all right. That's all right. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And we've got to be careful that we don't find ourselves in a perpetual state of fear. Because I've seen it. Nobody here because y'all are so anointed. But I've seen it with people that there is so much fear. Then God shows up 
and then all of a sudden there is praise. But as soon as the next storm, am I talking to somebody? As soon as the next storm breaks out, oh my goodness, woe is me. I don't know how I got into this, Lord. I mean, you see what's taking place, and then God moves for you once again, and then you are in praise. But then the next storm breaks out, and you are in fear like you've never seen God do anything in your life before. Am I talking to somebody here? But when you have mature faith, it doesn't produce fear. It produces authority. See, when you have immature faith, it's fear because you don't know what's going to happen because your faith is only based on what you can see. But when you have mature faith, you walk in authority because your faith is not what you can see. It's what God had already said. So when you have trials that come your way, you don't speak fear into it. You speak faith into it. You don't speak fear into it. You speak the word of God over it. And you know that the word of God is the final authority so I figure if my situation is broken but I speak the word of God over my situation the situation over time has got to look like the word of God if you speak in authority and you speak in faith I'm tired of us being in a perpetual state of fear God has given us his promises he will never leave us or forsake us so what are we afraid of he is more we're more than a conqueror so what are we afraid of the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And if we are walking in the most powerful authority that is on this earth and he's able to have authority over every sickness, every issue of life, every storm, every plan of pestilence, everything that comes against you, what in the world are we afraid of? So here is what I recommend if you are in a place hallelujah where your faith has been stagnant it's time to wake up it's time to get up out of your sleep and it's time to stand and go before the Lord there is no judgment hallelujah one thing for me as a pastor if you come to me you can tell me you are struggling with anything and there will be absolutely no judgment in fact I will respect you even more for even confessing it so we can be fixed. But the part that I have a problem with is people who have stuff but are in denial of their stuff. Or people who have stuff and don't want to let go of their stuff. And they don't want to come out of their stuff. And they just want to be stuck in their stuff. They just want to talk about your stuff while they're not dealing with their own stuff. And we are in the last days and we don't have time to be doing all this ticky-tack nonsense. We've got to get to a point where we have to grow in our faith. God is coming back soon and the church has got to be ready. Somebody clap your hands and give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we look at this text. This text was written by the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter, it was during the reign of the Emperor Nero. Very evil Roman king. And it was early AD 60 where he wrote these texts to encourage people that were going through persecution. Are you with me? He wrote these to encourage people that are going through persecution. What kind of persecution were they going through? I'm glad you asked. See, back during that day, it wasn't always necessarily rounding up Christians and killing them, and it wasn't that. But here's what it was. See, the Roman Empire came in and they were in rule and there were people that were so happy and they gave so much credit and faith to the Roman Empire that they passed a law oh you're not going to believe this they passed a law you know what they said they said every citizen must go once a year take a dab of incense and go watch this to the idol of Caesar and declare Caesar is Lord. Once a year, every citizen had to go and declare once a year that Caesar is Lord. If you did that, you could worship whoever you wanted to worship every other day of the year. And there were some Christians 
I wish it was all Christians. I wish it was, there were some Christians that said, I don't care if it's one day. I don't care if it's one hour. I don't care if it's one minute. I'm not bowing down and telling that anybody else is Lord except Jesus. So as a result, they were looked at as lawbreakers. So he ended up breaking the law, and they were under heavy persecution. People thought that the Christians were cannibals. You know why? Because they celebrated Holy Communion. And all they heard was, what, you eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus? And they were very misunderstood, confused, and accused. How many when you know when you don't have understanding, you tend to ridicule what you don't understand? Are you hearing what I'm saying? So as a result, they were under a constant state of persecution. So Peter had to write this letter to encourage them in the midst of what they were going through. Right. Are you there? Amen. Can we fast forward to 2024? In 2024, we as the people of God are in a heavy season of testing. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. We are in a heavy season of testing as a body of Christ that will, somebody say will, will. include persecution. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. We have been teaching on the book of Revelation, and I tell you this, whenever we have these teachings, you got to show up and you've got to watch it because we are living out those times right before our very eyes. Yeah. It is very important. We have them online. Go back and watch them. God has us going through and made me teach every single chapter. You know why? Because we are in a time of testing, but Freedom Movement Church is an end times church. Come on. Amen. Amen. That's all right. We don't have to say amen. We are an end times church, and I would do you a disservice by keeping you in la-la land. By telling you to name it and claim it and name it. Oh, just run around the church for your blessing. It's going to be all right. And all around us, the sky is falling. I would do a disservice as if we were at business as usual. But how many know we're in wartime? I do you a disservice to tell you what you want to hear and paddicate you and say, go get your blessing. Oh, your destiny, the month of April is the month. The devil is a liar. Jesus Christ is about to come back soon, and the people of God are going to be tested. He that hath heard, let him hear what the Spirit says. The church is about to go through an intense shaking. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're about to go through an intense shaking, and the circumstances are already upon us. I don't usually do this, but I want you to turn the Bible a couple places with me because it's something that God wants to speak prophetically through his word. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Oh, God, the, our people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Our people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. We're going to make this clear so we can know how we can proceed. Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to read verses 4 through 8. It reads like this. And Jesus answered. I mean, let me go back. I'm going to go to verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Sound familiar? See that you are for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be, watch this, famines and earthquakes. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. 
There will be famines and earthquakes, New York, New York. There will be famines and earthquakes, Taiwan. Are y'all paying attention to the news? All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Can we go somewhere else? I promise you this is a different message today, but I need everybody to listen up. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, go with me right now. Hallelujah. We are in a season where it's time to sound the alarm. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Peter is quoting the book of Joel. And this is the time when the Holy Spirit fell on the believers. He said, in the last days, it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. That's why you're getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. This is why the spirit of God is speaking to you. You, don't, you never experienced it, but you've got to obey what the Lord says. Watch this, verse 19. I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. What's tomorrow? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass, watch this, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I got one more to read to you, and I promise you when we get back. Are y'all, is this all right? Hallelujah, I got to tell the truth. This is the last one, Psalm 91. <laughs> I need y'all to read this with me. It simply says, he who dwells in the shelter, I'm up shop by myself, of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. <laughs> I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. For he, y'all ready for the prophetic word? For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. We are going into a time of testing, but the Lord is going to protect his people like never before. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we have to get to a place where we know that time is running out. This is the season that the people of God get their house in order. Stop tolerating the mess on the floor and begin to sweep some stuff up. Put it in the trash can. Put it in the recycle. But don't recycle it yourself. Get it up out of your house because Jesus Christ is coming back soon. This is the time if you have unrepentant sin, if you stuck in the turn up, you got to get up out the turn up and turn down your plate. Turn down the evil and get in his presence and say, Lord, I know we don't have enough time, but show me what my gifts are. Show me what my calling is. Show me what I have to do because we have to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. I know we are protected and I know the end times are coming and we are going through trials trials of many kinds, but I need somebody to count it all joy when you go through trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith works patience. Patience must make its perfect work that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We're about to go through, but we are not going to be tore down. We are about to go through testing, but we're going to come out as pure gold. We're going to be refined. We're going to be renewed. We're going to be strengthened. We're going to be stronger than we ever were and we're giving God glory in advance. Somebody give him praise right now. 
Hallelujah. 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 Mm -mm -mm. If every message you hear at a church is flowery, you better leave that church. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm on assignment. I want to make sure we get this. So, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. You're ringing the alarm bells. Jesus Christ is coming back. And we are all going to be tested and we're all going to go through. So how do we persevere in the midst of the test? Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's go. I got three ways that we can persevere and we can get through this because we are getting through it. Somebody say amen. amen. Watch this. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. That's what we're preaching from. He said, Beloved, do not be surprised. Uh, <laughs> he said, do not be surprised. This is important. Do not be surprised at the, golly, the tri not the trial, but the fiery trial. That thing got some heat on it. Amen. Anybody ever been on that thing? You got some heat on it. You're just like, Lord, it's a lot of heat. I love you, but it's a lot of heat. I need some real saints in here to just admit. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when, golly, Lord, when it comes upon you. Do not be surprised when it comes upon you. It's coming upon us. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Point number one. Perseverance, write it down. Perseverance requires a proactive posture. Let me say it one more time. Your perseverance requires a proactive posture. Watch this. Many of us know that we are victorious through the power of God. Is this true? We are victorious through the power of God, but victory is not fully about God's power. I need somebody to get this teaching. See, it's not fully about God's power. It's also about our posture. So many times... We had the victory, but we missed the victory because we didn't have the right posture. Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? See, too many of us have what I call a reactive relationship. Meaning that you wait to start going deep in prayer when you see the warfare coming against you. And at that point, you begin to become a prayer warrior because you see the enemy attacking your child. And it's at that point where you are caught off guard and by the time you see the enemy, he's already in your house. But when you have a proactive posture, everything can be perfect. Everything can be sunny and blue skies. But even at that point, I'm deep in prayer, and I'm saying I thank you for giving me this peace. But when the day of evil comes, I'm going to be ready because my house is going to be covered, and I'm praying in advance. I'm not waiting for my wife to be in attack for me to start praying for her. I'm going to start praying for her even when we're at peace. I'm going to start praying for her when the finances are great. I'm going to start praying for her when we are seeing eye to eye because I know the enemy is waiting for an opportunity to slip through a window to get up in there. So by the time the enemy comes, he doesn't have an open door because my house is already prayed. And we got to get to a point as the people of God that we got to stop waiting for the drama and know the drama is coming, but we're going to be fortified when it comes. That's why some of y'all get up and get to work and you let the littlest thing knock your whole day off. I can't believe they said something to me. I'm like, of course they're going to say something to you. You anointed and appointed. Of course they're going to try to get you out because you have a call on your life. Of course the devil's going to try to get you. Do you understand the kingdom impact that God is calling you to make? Of course the enemy's going to come again. What did you expect? He was going to sit around and watch your marriage be blessed and not have something to try to get in there? Oh, 
it all so often. We sitting around do 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 waiting for something to happen. Oh Lord, I need you to make nope, I knew it was coming. I'm gonna be ready for him at the door. I see him trying to get I'm gonna be right at the back door. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but power principalities spiritual wickedness in high places. I'm already standing on the word. I'm already standing on the promises. I'm already standing because I know I'm victorious, but I'm ready even when I don't see it. Somebody give God praise. Here's what you have to understand. Please hear this. It's not just about God's power. It's also about your posture. This is important. It's not just about God's power. It's about your posture. Some of y'all say, nah, all I need is the power. Now, can we, can we go to the word so I can clear this up in your mind? You know, I just got Jesus, and that's all I need. Okay, can we go to the word and put some context on this thing? Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, uh, The enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But you know what it said before that? Be sober and be vigilant. It's not just about power. It's about your posture. You remember when, when Paul in Philippians 4 said, And the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding shall guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is a peace that only comes from God. But it's not just about God's power because you will never get that peace unless you be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. It's not just about God's power, it's about your posture. Do you remember in Isaiah chapter 26, verse three, he says that he will keep you in perfect peace. All the power of God can only give you perfect peace. But if you have to read the whole sentence, the whole sentence says he'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. It's not just about his power, it's about your posture. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. God promises in Ephesians chapter 6 that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But it first says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So you, yes, God has power to give you victory, but you still have a responsibility to put on the whole armor of God. You still have a responsibility to be strong in the Lord. You still have a responsibility to position yourself for victory. See, you have to understand, don't just rely on the power. God says, I'm ready to make you get you in your posture and your position so I can bless based on your obedience to my word. And when you're in position, I will bless and move, but I'm not going to do it if you don't have the right posture. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Perseverance requires a proactive posture. <laughs> That's why he didn't just say, don't be surprised of the fiery trial. Later he says, but rejoice. Somebody say posture. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Your posture is going to change your position. I believe it. Somebody say amen. Perseverance requires a proactive posture. Hallelujah. Make sure, I don't know who's listening, make sure that you don't let a day go by without you covering your house in prayer. Right. Don't let a day go by covering your house in prayer. Hallelujah. Husbands, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Husbands, where the husbands in at? We got some husbands in here. This is a commercial break for the husbands. Hallelujah. Yep, I know you. You a provider. Amen. Hallelujah. But don't get all arrogant and puffed up that I provide, I pay the bills around here. Your greatest provision is covering your house. Your greatest provision is being able to discern what's going on in your wife and being able to pray in the spirit. Your greatest provision is to be able to take your kids and your children and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No, nope, you can't watch that. No, nope, you can't wear that. No, nope, we're not going to go to bed angry. We are going to stay on one accord because I have a responsibility to have a proactive posture. And when you are a single man, get with God and become that right man of God to you can have the right posture. Can we, can we move? 
Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. Watch this. To test you. Okay, okay. Do not be surprised. This thing preaches itself. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. Watch this. To test you. Uh huh. So you have the instance, the fiery trial, and then you have the reason to test you. God never allows a trial without a purpose. God never allows you to go through randomly. There's no such thing as a random storm. Y'all miss that. If you have a storm in you, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Some of y'all thinking there's no coincidence to it. It's a re Some of y'all haven't put the connected dots. You've been going through the same storm every year. God, enemies just throw my face. No, there is a purpose and a reason why God keeps saying yes to that attack on your life. Y'all not liking me today. I got to tell it like it is. It is what it is. I'm sorry. Are you hearing it? But he says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial. When it comes, so now we know it's coming, but now we know why it's coming. Sometimes we know that it's coming, and we can't move forward until we know, wait, I get closure on. Why did you do that? Why did you say that to me? Just give me closure. Are you sure you want to break up with me? It's not about them. It's about God's purpose, not theirs. Stop trying to chase closure after people and get the closure from God. They left. Let them go. It's all right. Stop that. I just need a reason. Can we just meet up? No. Meet up with God and move forward with your destiny. I'm trying to get through it, Teresa. Listen, point number two. It's right there. God's purpose. Write it down. Oh, my. God's purpose is greater than your pain. We write it down. Oh, goodness. God's purpose is greater than your pain. That's right there. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. If you only focus on your pain, you will only be focused on the strange thing that's happening to you. So every trial and tribulation, if you're not careful, and if it's only about your pain, the only thing you'll see in your trial is yourself. And you can't get any kind of, con why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? Why is this strange thing happening to me? But God says, it's not so much about your pain as it is about God's purpose. What's the purpose? It's right there. We're just teaching it straightforward. When it comes upon you, here's the purpose to test you. And sometimes you mad at God thinking you getting all uh, religious on them. Talk about my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know when King James on them that he's forsaken you and he ain't forsook you. You know what he did? He loved you. He loved you because if you uh, read Hebrews 12, right around verse 6, it says, endure hardship as discipline. That he chastises those whom he loves. The test is an act of love because he loves you enough to grow you. He loves, he loves you enough to keep you moving forward. He loves you enough to strengthen your faith. He loves you enough to give you more anointing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is very, very important. So watch this. God never allows pain without purpose. Uh -huh. And God allows pain because he's fully invested in your development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody has something in common. All of our purpose is to move and be a blessing to somebody's pain. 
But how can you be a blessing to pain if you've never been through it yourself? How can you speak to pain if you've never experienced it? Remember when Jesus said the spirit of the Lord is that he, when he quoted Isaiah 61 1 in Luke chapter 4, that he anointed me to speak, uh, speak the good news to the brokenhearted. <laughs> he knew he was called to pain. Are you hearing me? So watch this. There is a quote from I love it. If you're a leader, if you want to be a leader, you are called to lead, you need to get this book. It's by Samuel Chan. It's called Leadership Pain. It'll bless your whole entire life, especially if you're a pastor. My goodness. He has this quote. You know what it says? Don't run from your pain. Don't deny it exists. It is the most effective leadership development tool the world has ever known. Some of y'all can't relate to it unless you've been there. You'll grow only to the threshold of your pain. We're not hearing this. You'll grow only to the threshold of your pain, so raise it. So he's saying, watch this. Don't run from it. It's that pain that God uses to cause you to grow even more. Are you hearing this? Anybody ever had pain that in the moment that thing hurt and there was nothing good about it, but then a year later, that pain turned into wisdom, and now you learn something from that pain that you went through, and now you went from hurting in the moment, but when you got the wisdom, you became thankful for the pain that you had a year ago, because if you never had that pain, you wouldn't think like you think right now. If you had never been hurt, you would have never raised the standard of your self-esteem. If it never came against you, you wouldn't have the prayer and fasting life that you have right now. Sometimes it don't feel good in the moment, but when you live a little and when your pain becomes purpose and when your pain becomes wisdom, now you know what to do. Can I give you a confession? I'm a better husband today because of the pain of my divorce yesterday. I'm a better father today because some of the pains and mistakes I made 10 years ago. And I begin to thank God for it all because if it wasn't for the pain, I wouldn't grow like I grow now. If it wasn't for the pain, I wouldn't shout like I shout now. If it wasn't for the pain, I wouldn't love like I love now. If it wasn't for, sometimes the thing that taught you how to manage your money was when your lights got cut off. Sometimes it took the calamity to God to shake you up and say, now do it my way. Now do it like I want. You tried your way, but you keep falling on the flat on your face. You tried your way, but it's not working out. At some point, you got to let God be God. And God is saying to somebody right now, you would still be doing your own thing if I didn't allow you to be wounded. You would still be chasing after what you used to chase after if I didn't allow your heart to get broken. You would still be doing the same thing you were doing five years ago if I didn't come and allow you to hurt. Is somebody grateful that you went through some pain? But your pain turned into praise. Oh my God. Somebody give them glory in this house. Can I let you know something? Pain is necessary. Y'all don't want to hear that today. Y'all didn't come to church to hear that. Pain was necessary, or else God would have never allowed it in the first place. See, you have to understand. Watch this. Olive. <laughs> in order, y'all not miss, y'all not listening. In order for the oil to be produced, the olive has to be crushed. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? And the more it's crushed, the more oil it produces. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? And we're grateful that the oil of anointing does not come without crushing. Y'all hear what I said? That's why you got to be careful about wanting somebody else's anointing. I promise you, you don't want this anointing. And I promise you, I don't want your anointing. Because yet you see how people flow and operate, but behind closed doors, do you see the demon attack that are coming? At, do you see what's all coming against them? That they're about to lose their mind, but it was only by the safety of God that kept them in the midst of it. Hallelujah, we got to go to point three. Let me say this real quick. See, another reason for the testing, God's purpose is greater than your pain. How many know that? Testing leads to confession. Testing leads to confession. Because the test is not for God to learn about what your weaknesses are. The tests are for you to learn about what your weaknesses are. God is all-knowing. He already knows what your weaknesses are. He's not doing the test so he can find out. He's doing the test so you can find out. God blesses, ooh, y'all not going to like me. I'm, I'm flowing the spirit. God loves you and blesses you by exposing you. Because God has a level of grace. But the grace has an expiration date. Did y'all hear what I said? There's going to come a time where the time period of grace is going to be over. And God loves you by exposing you. But when he exposes you, it's not for your embarrassment, but it's for your transformation. Did y'all hear what I said? It's not for you to be ashamed in front of people. It's for you to be repentant in the presence of God. And the more you realize that the root of the test is this flawed area, God can't fix it until you confess it. Are y'all here? Point number one, perseverance requires a proactive posture. Point number two, God's purpose is greater than your pain. Ooh, hallelujah. Let's, uh, let's go to point number three. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. As though something strange were happening to you. Watch this. It says, but rejoice. I'm going home. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Watch this. Point number three. Praise must be a crucial discipline for your destiny. Let me say that again. Let me say it over here. Praise must be a crucial discipline for your destiny. Can I, can I tell somebody something? Some of us are getting it mixed up. That's why we don't praise like we should. Because praise is not an occurrence. Praise is a discipline. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me say, y'all not getting me yet. Y'all not getting me yet. See, many people praise him when you get the new car. That's called the happy praise. When you can praise him and it's easy because you feel good. God opened up the door that no man can shut. So I can easily run around the church because God did it, and I'm giving him a happy praise. Uh -huh. And we are under the misconception that the praise is connected to our circumstance. Yeah. Misconception. But praise is not an occurrence. Praise is a discipline. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because praise must take place because he's saying in this text, I know you are going through, but just praise him. On the surface, it seems insensitive. You mean to tell me I'm going through all this persecution by the Roman government and your answer is rejoice? Okay, thank you. Anybody, you ever told somebody, build your heart, and somebody just said, man, just pray about it. Why are you doing all that? Just pray about it. You know how that made you feel? Just pray about it, huh? I got, I got your pray about it. 
But sometimes it seems on the surface like it's insensitive. Oh, but rejoice. But Peter wasn't being insensitive. He was being truthful. Because he had to understand that praise is not an occurrence based on my happy circumstance. But praise is a discipline that's based on my faithful God. Praise doesn't take place when the marriage is going up. But praise is a discipline that even if the finances are down, God is always up. And I'm going to praise God because he's always up. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Praise does not have to do with him or her or it or them. Praise has to do with him. Praise does not have to do with how you're feeling in your body. Praise doesn't have to do with if you've got aches and pains or not. Praise is even when you're hurting the most, you're praising him the most because you know that God is a healer. And not only do you know that God can deliver you, but even if he doesn't deliver you, he'll keep you. Some of us don't praise until we get delivered. But some of us know how to praise because even if we're not delivered yet, we're still kept in the midst of the storm. We're still kept in the midst of the rain. We're still kept in the midst of the conflict. We're still kept in the midst of the trial because at the end of the day, we're going to give him praise anyway because every trial is connected to God's mercy. Whatever you're dealing with, you do realize it could be ten times worse. When you were in that accident, it could have taken your life, but you only had bumps and bruises. When you had that financial storm, you could have lost lost everything but you and be homeless but you still had a job to go to you still had food on your table you still got your bills paid somehow some way so when you are praising him it's not about an occurrence it's about the discipline and praising God every time because he's always faithful are you hearing this my praise is two things is somebody with me my praise is consistent because in my consistent praise, I realize that God is always faithful and he's too wise to make a mistake. But my praise is not only consistent, it is also persistent. Anybody have a persistent praise? See, your persistent praise is saying, Lord, I praise, but Lord, I also pray. So in my praise, I have a persistence because not only am I grateful for who you are, but I'm grateful for you answering my prayer. Oh, y'all not talking to me. Sometimes you've got to have a consistent prayer and you have to have a, a persistent praise. Because when you praise him consistently, it's the goodness of God. But when you praise him persistently, you're expecting God to move. You're expecting God to be God. You're expecting God to deliver. You're expecting God to heal. You're expecting God to set free. You're expecting God to make whole. And no matter how long it takes, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm not going to let go until I see it. I'm not going to let go until the door busts wide open. I'm not going to go until I see the breakthrough. I'm not going to let go until we're restored and back together. I'm not going to let go until God does what he promised in my spirit. And I'm just going to continue to be consistent and I'm going to be persistent. I'm consistent because I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. But I'm persistent that I'm not going to let you go, Lord, because you promised me. And I'm going to stay on your promise till I see it in the natural. I know it's already in the spirit, so I'm going to give you praise. But as soon as I see it in the natural, I'm going to keep giving you praise, no matter what. Is there somebody that has a praise on the inside? We might go through something as a nation, but it's not going to take our praise. We may have war and rumors of wars, but it's not going to take our praise. We may have food shortages and famine, but it's not going to take our praise. We're not going to fear. We're going to prepare. We're not going to fear. We're going to pray. We're not going to fear. We're going to praise. We're not going to fear, we're going to listen. We're not going to fear, we're going to be sensitive. We're not going to fear, we're going to listen to the voice of God. And whatever he tells us to do, he will protect us. And I'm going to give him praise. Everybody stand to your feet right now. Everybody stand to your feet right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise must be a crucial discipline for your destiny. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It is well. It is well with our soul. Hallelujah. 
do not be surprised. Did you hear what I said? Do not be surprised by the fiery trial that is coming upon you to test you. Hear the prophetic word. The church is about to be tested. God's people are about to be tested. But the, the people of God are also about to be covered like we've never been covered before. Did you hear what I said? Hallelujah. And you know what the Lord is teaching us as a church? Hallelujah. When you're playing basketball, one thing that you've got to learn is to be able, as you're driving to the hole, and you've got defenses coming against you, the best finishers around the rim are the ones who anticipate and absorb the contact. Because if you get hit and you don't know how to absorb the contact, the defense is going to knock you down. But when you finish and go to the hole and you learn, anticipate, and absorb the contact, you can still get hit but still make the shot. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but you get the basket and the foul. You just tell the devil and one. Yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Why am I telling you this? God wants to raise up a church that can absorb the contact and still serve. God wants to raise up a church that can take the blow but still get right back up and still pray. So God is teaching us, watch this. Don't miss the blessing. I'm trying, and, I mean, and sometimes we'll ask God to take us out of it too early. God says, I have to teach you and keep you in something for an extended period of time so you can learn how to still thrive in the midst of the pain. You can still pray and minister in the midst of your suffering. You can still see the other needs around you even when you're in need yourself. Listen, listen, listen. Hear the word of the Lord. He's raising up a battle-tested church. In this season, God is raising a battle-tested church. Freedom Movement Church is not going to sit around in the fetal position and seeing things go wrong and saying, Lord, help us. Freedom Movement Church already heard the prophecies. So we're in place and prepared to meet the needs of the people. Somebody say amen. So the next time 